comes up every year and is a, uh, an important principle of pruning is that if we say pruning is depressive, as I said last time, you should have asked me out in the lab, well, if pruning is depressive and we have a young vine, or if we have a vine and, and that we're still trying to shape properly, Suppose we got the trunk up like this. Well, that's some chalk. I don't tend to have that. See? And we make the trunk <laughs> one piece. If I throw it out, we don't have any. Um, and uh, I can fill it in, I guess. Wear it down somewhere. Okay. <laughs> And we've got a, uh, a weak arm over on this side and a fairly strong one. I'm just going to keep this to its simplest over here. Okay. Out the fourth time, we'll get this great vine on the board. If you've got a, a weak arm over on this side and a fairly strong one over here, and I tell you out in class, and this can go for spurs as well as arms, that if we want to increase the size on this over here, with grapes, we would prune uh, the wood over here back to one bud, perhaps. And over here, if we want this to stay weak, we leave, let's exaggerate and say we leave three buds. But pruning is depressive. And if pruning is depressive, am I not doing this backwards? That's one question to ask. You'd think if pruning was depressive, why am I pruning this so much harder than this if I want this side to get bigger? That's the sort of thing you ought to think about when you're reading principles of pruning. And the answer, well, in tree crops, if you've got a young orchard and you, for example, walnut trees be a good example, young walnut tree, young peach tree or something, uh, if you want the, to, train it to a central leader, you leave the central part fairly long and prune these sides back a little bit because you want the, the growth to, to go up and make the central trunk big and strong. So you prune it lightly because pruning is depressive. Now, how do you, how do you uh, rationalize those two arguments? Well, the answer is this. Of course, that uh, if you if you plot increasing number of buds, this is greater number of buds now that you leave, and this is uh, uh, amount of crop, the weight of crop, or which is what's going to really uh, wear your uh, plant down. If you're talking about trees, as you in, as you leave more and more buds, you increase the crop like this. With, with young trees. In other words, you can leave quite a few more leaves on, a few more, more buds on, and increase the crop very little. But when you go to grapes and you start doing this, you're going to increase the crop like that. And this great increase in crop per bud overcomes this effect that you gain from leaving more buds. So if you leave more buds on here, uh, you will get greater capacity out of this area, you'll get greater capacity and total of fruit plus shoot growth. That's fruit <coughs> plus shoot growth. But because the crop goes up so much faster than the leaf surface, you will get a weakening effect in the case of grapes. But over here on this young walnut tree, especially a young one that you're training, which may not be more than three or four years old, you might be able to leave on uh, six or eight or ten extra buds and pick up maybe two walnuts. So with all those extra buds, you put a whole lot more uh, leaf surface up in here, and you feed this part of the plant so that it becomes bigger and stronger. And you get more leaves here, too, than you do here but you've got this terrific rapid increase in crop which wears it out, overworks it, so that you get a weakening effect. 
over here and then with one bud, <coughs> you're back down in here somewhere, and you, you've increased the leaf surface some, but you still got a light crop. But with those three buds, you're out here, and you picked up a terrific amount of crop. <coughs> Later on, we'll point out, until somebody's getting ready to ask it, uh, how many leaves do you need for a cluster of fruit? And Dr. Cleaver's worked on this very quantitatively, and his general rule he's come out with is it takes about 10 square centimeters of leaf surface to produce one gram of fruit. So uh, you're, he'll give you that in detail with slides that go on in the next quarter. But that gives you some idea. Of that. Now, to say I want to dis discuss some of these things which aren't so obvious in the text, because I assume that since most of you are seniors and grad students, you can read the text as well as I can. Um, now, one other little comparison while we're talking about it. Now, this is trees, young trees. Um, is the confusion that the people who are taking pomology have with our, with our actual mechanics of pruning in the field. Remember, we keep telling you and telling you that if you're cutting off one-year wood, one-year-old canes of either water sprout or uh, regular canes, that you want to cut it very clean. You want to cut it very clean if you're cutting this off. But if you're going to leave two-year-old wood, you leave a stub out here. I never thought I'd run into a handicap of a piece of chalk with a crack in it. So you leave the stub out here, roughly, as we say, half the diameter in length beyond the, the shoot. Uh, leave a stub half the diameter of the part you're cutting off. Now, if, you've t if you're taking pomology at the same time, this ought to cause all sorts of frustration because Dr. Crane will shoot you if you leave a stub like that on a tree. A tree. And the point is that on trees, you can cut this all smooth, and it'll heal over and with callus. But with grapevines, this does not heal over. It just leaves the scars. If you cut it clean here, you leave an open wound, which uh, the shorter it is and the closer it is, the more drying out that you can get, and the uh, more readily and quicker you begin to get rot and decay down into here, which may finally leave you just a little rim of green wood supporting the shoot. So the longer you can leave the stub within limits to not look too bad, the better off you should be. So those are the two things I want to point out that were differences between trees and vines at this moment. Now, the, I said that you can read as well as I can, but in here we ought, I think just as a group, go over this uh, figure 69 that's in the text. And uh, we have the slide, figure 69 in the text, but if this reminds me of something else I wanted to tell you about, and that is that those of you who have read it, the top of page 237, just make a note of that, the top of 237 is a very fouled up paragraph. And if you don't know what is going on, you can't understand it. Um, in the first place, you just make a note of this, in the first place he's saying that, you, that uh, he's comparing the effect he says, whereas a pruned vine suffered the combined depressive effect of crop and pruning. But he just pointed out that the one series has no crop at all, and the other size has uh, uh, no pruning at all. So the slide does not illustrate the combined effects of crop and pruning because they're completely separated. That was the whole point of the, of the figure. Well, we straightened that out in the new text. But if you read that, you'd be really confused with that sentence. It's not the, com that's, a, that's an error in the uh, text. And then the very next sentence, a greater capacity of less severely pruned vines is illustrated in figure 66. It's not figure 66, it's 65. So that above on page 237 is a bit of a mix-up in the text. Well, let's show that first slide then and see if there are any questions on it. And I'm not even sure we need to pull that. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, I guess we've got to pull the drape there a little bit. Get the lights off. That might probably be it. And that's good enough. This is the one that's in your text. And we just want to discuss these various al uh, alternatives in pruning. And you see, we go from this severe, severely pruned all-crop vine with only this much fruit, 
over to a non-pruned vine with that much fruit. So uh, I can't read this myself. This is the average annual crop. Uh, take not this isn't pounds of fruit. Remember, it's taking this as this is being 100. So these are relative crops. They're not actual weights. They're relative to this as 100. And obviously, as the text points out, we can't go with you can't stay in business with this type of pruning, and you can't tolerate this type of pruning. But uh, just to point out some of these things here, we, we can see that this one has the smallest crop of all. Uh, oddly enough, the fruit is only of fair quality because although at the end of the year, you've got quite a bit of growth, at the beginning of the year, if you recall last time the slide I showed, it takes you forever to build up enough leaf surface to amount to give you any help. So even though you've got a very small crop, you also don't get that maximum leaf surface until late in the fall in which it's the effective memory. I say that the capacity of the vine depends upon not only the amount of leaf surface, but the, the length of time in which that leaf surface has to operate. So in this period from bud break up until after fruit set, if you go back to that other slide where we, where we plotted uh, leaf increase as the season went on, or severely pruned ones were way down here, whereas the uh, the ones that were normally pruned or cane pruned and, and thin were way up here, something like that. So the leaf surface that you've got out here about bloom time is greatly different. And then this, of course, and that I told you that in those first six weeks, that's when the flowers come out and actually are uh, go from a few uh, cells up to the completed flower parts. And you have to have leaf surface during that time in order to get a good uh, large flower cluster, which will set well. So as I say, oddly enough, you do not get uh, uh, good, good clusters. You get small clusters. You may get poor set because of this lack of carbohydrate and the nutrition. But at the end of the year, they will be high in sugar because you have a light crop. And by the, end of the, by the time you get around August or September, this leaf surface has built up excuse me, high enough so that for the light crop that you've got on it, uh, you do get a good maturity of the fruit. But you could hardly use that system for growing table fruit because you wouldn't have large clusters and you'd have quite a bit of the shot berries because as I say, what I just discussed. So this is extreme where you get the greatest vigor and the, and the lowest capacity, capacity being growth and fruit. You've got the, the lowest growth and the lowest fruit, the lowest capacity then from severe pruning. If you go to this other extreme over here, where we have no pruning in all crop, you'll get the largest crop. But once again, you'll get small clusters because you have so many of them. See, just to give you an idea how many clusters you can put uh, have on a vine, that winter vine out there, I mean, I've told some of you that even when it was about five years old, he had 6,000 clusters on it. And he had to go out and take off 4,000 to thin it down to a, to a one-ton crop. And uh, that becomes expensive. But anyway, with something like an extreme of 6,000 clusters, you can imagine how big an individual cluster would be. So you wind up with uh, many, many very small clusters. And again, because you have a lot of clusters for the amount of leaves present, even though this, the leaf surface built up very rapidly, if you didn't take off some of the clusters, you're still down to a low leaf to cluster ratio because you've got so many thousands of clusters. So once again, you can get poor set from uh, poor flower development. You'll have small berries. And at the end of the year, even though you've got that large leaf surface, you've got such a large crop that you're going to have low balling on it, low sugar. See, contrary to this, which would have high sugar at the end of the year, the fruit over here will still be uh, overcropped if you leave all the crop on, do no thinning at all. So that's the opposite extreme then where you have the lowest vigor of individual shoots and the highest capacity. And perhaps this is a good place to bring in, just leave the lights out, uh, leave it where it is. I can put this on here. Bring in the answer to that fourth question on your quiz in which I was talking about up there. We talk about reduced wood growth on the severely pruned. 
that that weakens the vine in the total amount of wood that might be produced, but the non-pruned vine or, or very lightly pruned vine also is low in wood growth. And what I want you to do is get the, the idea in your mind that on this, we can use a cordon since most of you did that, that if you severely prune this vine, it may have uh, eight or ten very strong shoots. But if you lightly prune a vine, uh, you can get lots of, sh lots of little short shoots. They may be a mess like this, but you get lots of little short shoots. And if you moderately prune the vine, you've got the shoots reduced down. Now, if you, if you take this vine that was moderately pruned, and especially if it was, I don't want to put that on there, if it was, uh, it was partly thinned, the total wood of all this great number of little shoots would add up to give you more weight of wood than the total weight of these. And I think I have some data here, which I wasn't going to put on, but maybe to prove that point, because it's always hard for you to believe. Is that moderately pruned? Well, well, of course, the more severely pruned it, the greater you're going to increase the, uh, the uh, wood growth. Now, let me get... Uh, for example, right here, I wasn't going to give you this, and each year then I finally wind up giving, putting it in anyway, but I'll, I'll just give you the essential ingredients, the same. Um, where you have severe pruning, where you have severe pruning, but all crop, plus all the crop, which is the extreme over there we were looking at, and I'll put it this way, uh, you had 23 shoots. And uh, with a total length of 133 feet. 133 feet. And a crop of 3.1 pounds. 3.1 pounds of fruit. Under severe pruning plus all crop, you get 23 shoots, equaling, equaling 133 feet total length and 3.1 pounds of fruit. But if you go to uh, a, a normal pruning plus thinning, uh, wait a minute, a normal, no, normal plus all crop. This is normal pruning plus all crop. You've got more shoots now. You wind up with 33 shoots, and that total length is 157 feet with 11.4 pounds of fruit. You can really get an idea of what this pruning then does to the capacity. 33 shoots versus 23, and giving you more shoots. But they, even though these are longer, that's, that was the point I was going to point out, and then I skipped the whole thing. These 23 shoots average 5.8 feet, whereas the one down, and the other one averaged 4.7, 4.7 feet. So you get, even the, though these are longer, individually, the total amount that you can get off the vine in total length or in total weight. If you take this in weight, you'd still you'd get the same relative type of differences. So this is what I was trying to, to get out of you on the quiz with that illustration, with that uh, fourth one, which I want you to diagram the vine. Some of you had some rather funny ideas on what I meant, but maybe that was my fault for not explaining it more clear, clearly. The point is that you can get what looks like more total growth when you just glance at the vine, when you have a, bunch, uh, a reduced number of very vigorous shoots, you often can get the idea that that vine produced more weight of wood than a moderately pruned vine, because a moderately pruned vine doesn't look so, doesn't look so vigorous. And, but if you take all the little bits and add them up and put them on the scale, that moderately pruned vine will still weigh more than the one that was severely pruned, because pruning is depressive. And as you see here, both on total growth and on total fruit. 
Okay, now let's go back to our slide. So that uh, we practically got to eliminate these two over here. If you go to this one of no pruning uh, and, uh, and all crop, you've just heard me say that it, you, you get a, a terrific amount of unmanageable fruit that's not very good quality. You could go to non-pruned and part crop. Why not do that? Don't prune it at all, but thin it. That's what the vine would like to have. In other words, don't, don't cut off any of its legs and arms, but don't make it work very hard either. <laughs> and uh, this gives you a double the crop. You see, of here's a normal pruned vine, and compared to a normal pruned vine, and this is when, by normal pruned vines, by the way, we're talking about basal buds only, just one bud on this. This is a normal two bud spur, and this is cane pruning. So under the normal, uh, two bud spur pruning, you get about half the crop you get on a vine that you didn't prune at all and thinned. The part crop, you'd thin it. I'd say that gives excellent fruit. It gives uh, good clusters, the, uh, high, high production, high sugar at, at harvest time, and because you thinned it down early, you've got a high leaf to cluster ratio so that you get nice set of fruit and it'd be what the vine would like to have. But obviously you can't have that either because in order to have unpruned vines, you don't even, I don't even have to draw you a picture, unpruned vines would just complete, become completely unmanageable. Uh, you can imagine the winker vine not pruned at all and not thinned at all, what a mess it would be in a few years. You couldn't even afford the trellises and certainly uh, the thinning costs of taking 4,000 uh, clusters off of each vine becomes ridiculous. So that that system has to be wiped out here too. So then you're down to the choices of these two. And I've gone over that repeatedly, that the best way to do it is to have uh, moderate pruning, that is either leave a few more spurs here or to leave cane pruning, and then to uh, uh, thin off some of the fruit to give you a higher leaf to cluster ratio with a uh, moderate crop. And this this is fine for table fruits, table fruit, uh, and gives you these large clusters, large berries, good set, good sugar and acid balance, a good crop with, a, with adequate growth to maintain that crop year after year, to maintain that crop year after year. And of course, that's a recommendation wherever the cost of the grapes will permit it. And as I told you before in one of the introductory lectures, uh, in the past, this has been considered feasible only for table grapes, but with the price of wine grapes today, this is becoming more and more a possibility to, uh, to leave more spurs, more buds, and then go in and do some thinning. Now, the vine would like to have this one here where you don't prune it at all and just leave part of the crop. That leaves uh, by far the greatest number of leaves per cluster. Okay, now, uh, there's several of these principles of pruning. Let's dive into those right now because, and just sort of hit the question marks. The question which is asked, by, been asked most often outside of class is, what do we mean by this number five on page 246, that the fruitfulness of the buds of a vine vary within limits? And I think we have a slide on that. Uh, Let's just put the slide up so we know what we're talking about. They're all familiar. No, the next slide. <coughs> this is the one that caused some of you some problems and what we mean by within limits. Really, what we really mean by within limits is uh, within, within limits on each side of the average cane diameter for that variety in that location. In other words, you don't want to go down to real small stuff, nor do you want to go up to the real big stuff. You want to stay close to this, apparently, was the uh, average length of shoots. And I would like to see this redone where it's done on diameter rather than on length of shoots. But the average of the, of the shoots for this particular variety lay in this area here. So that within limits means uh, around the average cane diameter of that variety. And if you get to the very big, vigorous bull canes is the column, and get something that's an inch in diameter or so on, it's going to be low and its buds are going to be low in fruitfulness. That's those flat canes 
or the very long inner nodes are often large in diameter or large in length, and their chances of fruit per bud is reduced as they get far larger than the average size for that variety, caused by too severe pruning or over thinning or over fertilization, over irrigation, and so on. Now, at the other end of the scale, you don't want to go out where the average size of the um, canes is maybe a, a half an inch in diameter. Excuse me, and they start picking up uh, uh, saving buds for fruiting wood that are only three eighths of an inch in diameter. Because then you get down into stuff that is poorly developed, either it started late in the season, uh, it was overcropped or drought, or lacking fertilizer, or you got it defoliated with leaf hopper, or red, rather red spider would be more likely the cause, or it can be injured or it can just be shaded out. And then that type of wood you do not want to keep. So the easiest way to interpret this is just to, for your own practical uh, application is to just think that you're going to leave the average size or slightly smaller perhaps, if, if you have to take a choice, slightly smaller than average rather than slightly larger. You see this is higher here. If this is our average, you get more fruitfulness in here than you have over here. So stay away from those large canes. Okay, now, then we get around to the answer to uh, the number three question you had on the quiz. Uh, I, I really thought I would get you to think a little bit on this one, and then that question number three, uh, give me two reasons why you would leave more buds on a large spur. I wanted you to tie in together rule five and rule six, because this shows that the larger the spur, the fewer clusters you're going to have per bud. Therefore, if you even want the same crop as you would get on a, on a normal spur, you've got to leave an extra bud. If a normal spur averages a, cluster, uh, averages a cluster and a half per bud, and this bigger one only averages a cluster per, per bud, if you leave two on both of them, you're going to get two clusters in one case and three in the other. So if you've got a, the average one is going to give you one and a half clusters per bud, let's say, on the, for the average spur. I think you can turn that off now. The, the average diameter spur. But this large spur is going to average one cluster per bud. Now, if you prune them both to to two buds, of course, you, obviously you're going to get three clusters on this one, and on this one you're only going to get two. But you were all told, and all of you gave me the answer, that the large spur ought to be able to carry more fruit. So if you're going to uh, balance this out then, you would have to leave, if you're going to make it carry more fruit than the average, then uh, this would, you'd have to leave twice as many buds on this large spur. See, this would be three clusters per two buds, per two buds. And this would be two clusters per two buds. So if you really want to increase the crop on this large spur, you're going to have to leave four buds. And that's what I want you to tell me, that the larger spur had a greater capacity to produce fruit and to produce growth, both capacity being growth and fruit. But you should have told me that you have to leave more buds on the large one because it is less fruitful. It has less chances of having the clusters in, its, in the bud. And this was stated just as clear as it can be stated in Rule 6 at the top of 247. As already pointed out, capacity is directly proportional to total growth. A cane of large size, therefore, has greater capacity than a small one. And all of you gave me that. And its buds are less, are likely to be less fruitful. And they say, see this principle five. This being the case, you should leave a longer, more buds on a cane, or more buds on a more cane, more buds on a large cane, and more buds on a large spur. And now this class is 75. One person answered it right. Exactly on the head. One other got the idea close enough that he got 
the full credit for it, but it wasn't quite exactly right. But one person got it, nailed it, and even called attention that this was another principle of pruning, volume five and six, which is exactly what I wanted. But, and I gave you this quiz partly with the idea that you had to have, pick up some points toward cutting down the importance of the final on your total grade, and partly to give you some idea of the type of exams you're going to get. And this is quite typical, I think, in that you're going to get a lot of short answer, uh, hopefully they're short answers, on, the, on exams. They're going to be broken down into fine two or three points and so forth per question. And another thing that came out of this was that when we do give a midterm of 15 questions or so, if one question comes out that practically everybody misses, um, we, we quite often throw it out. So since there's only two people got 13 on this quiz, uh, you can really consider that this is an 11 point quiz. We gave two points for each of those first two and five points for that question three. I gave you three points if you got, if you got the idea that uh, the easy part about it, uh, the capacity, a large spur has greater capacity, and then two if you got this other idea. But uh, it turned out, as I say, only one got it right and a couple of others uh, got close enough so that they got 12 points out of it. And then four points for the sketch. So that, as I say, you can all, so far, we always grade on class average. And except for the fact that one person got 13 and two people got 12, you can assume that this is basically an 11 point quiz with this, with this thrown out. Or we're thinking that three people out of the class got a bonus of two to three points. But I did, uh, now a lot of you gave me another reason. And we went through, and we're going to give you credit for that, at least two points credit for it. But then it's stated so specifically in here, and I told you to study these principles of pruning, and they're in italics, and you had a, even a graph to go by, even this slide that we've been looking at, that I decided that there was no excuse for you not having gotten that. Uh, but the a other answer that you gave, you gave that the large spur has more capacity and then you said that uh, we've got to, to leave more buds on the large spur in order to slow down the vigor and balance out the vine to keep it proportional. And that's a pretty good reason. And uh, as I said, if it hadn't been stated so specifically in here what I wanted you to give me, I would give you credit on that under normal conditions. But you didn't get it, as you saw. Dr. Mm -hmm. was in the wording of the question, was it uh, these uh, balancing of fruit and wood on a large as opposed to a small or a large as opposed to an average? It didn't, it didn't even mention uh, uh, small or average. It just said, give two reasons why you should leave more buds on a large spur. That's exactly the way the question was stated. But a lot of you went to give me the discussion of a large versus a small and what happens to a small one and what happens to a medium one and all this. But the answer was rather clear as I say, with these two points. Okay, now, I say I'm hitting the things which have caused trouble in the past. I'm not going through these, these uh, uh, principles of pruning in great detail. I think we can gain more by going to the, the, the trouble some more. And one of them is the second principle. You don't need to know these by one, two, and three, and four, but if you want to just make a note to yourself in the book, page 245, number two, where it says the production of crop depresses the capacity of the vine. And that has also been reworked in the new text because it's confusing. Because we, one of the first things I told you, that capacity equals growth <coughs> plus fruit. Now, if production of crop depresses the capacity, how do you, how do you get that together? If, 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 if the crop goes up, the capacity goes down, according to that statement. But according to what the formula I've got on here, if fruit goes up, growth goes down, and capacity stays the same. So what, what's, how do we explain that? Well, in the, te in the new text we've explained it, is in, the, in that the production of crop depresses the capacity of the vine for next year's production. 
for next year's production. Because now, when we uh, put on a lot of fruit, we weaken the growth, and then next year that weak growth won't have as much capacity. And it took me about five years or 10 years to get that <laughs> clarified in my own mind, what he's, ta what he's talking about in that rule. Because if you go, uh, one of these rules here, now I just touch on it because I'll come back to it later. Uh, he, uh, which one is it here? Somewhere. Anyway, the, the uh, statement is that a, the capacity of a vine right now out in the vineyard has already been determined by its behavior last year. The capacity is determined by its behavior last year. All you're going to do with the pruning shears is divide it up between these two. So if that's the case, then the production of crop, once again, couldn't be a reason for reducing this year's capacity. The capacity, either as growth or as fruit production, is standing there in the vine right now. You're just going to shape it up and distribute it between these two. So get that in mind, then, that cropping does uh, reduce the capacity, but it's the next year through this weak growth effect. Okay, now, are there any questions on these so-called main principles of pruning, these seven that are in italics that I haven't touched on here? If not, I'm, if not we'll go on to the lesser ones here, which I think uh, need ex uh, expanding on a little bit more than these basic ones. These are, these are spelled out so clearly, except for these two that I've hopefully clarified for you that I don't think there's any point in our spending time going through them by detail. Except one more of them, I guess, we ought to touch on because it's basic to the whole thing, and that is that a given vine, I'll repeat this, a given vine in a given season can only nourish and ripen a certain quantity of fruit. Here's the one I was looking for. Its capacity is, is determined or limited by its previous history and environment. And that's one I just discussed. Now, that part of it. Now, let's finish it up. Say uh, its capacity has been determined by its environment. And what do we mean by environment? Well, part of that we mean if it's a, if it's a uh, scrubby little vine on a dry hillside in Napa Valley, its capacity is going to be considerably lower than one of a vine standing out here on 30 feet of Yolo loam getting irrigated. So that's what we mean by environment. And of course, the other point there, uh, its previous history is the way it was treated last year and, and, and whether or not you fruited heavily by light pruning or fruited it lightly by severe pruning to get growth. So that, with that capacity determined, it can only mature, you can only leave so much fruit on the vine. I said that you can go out there and put on crop and take advantage of this capacity this year and weaken growth. And you may weaken the growth too much for next year's crop. But you can only leave on a certain amount of fruit which will be properly matured. And that's the point you want to underline, that, that, it's, that the capacity of the vine before you touch it with the pruning shears is already determined and its ability to produce fruit is already limited if you consider that fruit as being properly matured fruit. And how do you tell whether or not you've taken it to the capacity of fruit that it can mature properly? What is properly matured fruit? Of course, for each variety, especially those of you in wine work, know that there, you'd have a desired balling or sugar and acid ratio when, you, when, the, when the fruit is ideal or <coughs> top quality for making wine. That's what we really mean then by bringing to proper maturity. And when you, and here's a point that you really want to get, that the best single indicator of overcropping of a vine is when the, when the fruit does not mature at the proper time. Excuse me. It should mature its fruit to, the, to a properly balanced sugar and acid ratio within a really a certain length of time for that variety. And if it is delayed beyond that, you're going to get improperly matured fruit. 
And this, if you take 105, is old hat because the longer you leave the fruit on to try to get the sugar up, the acid is going to drop lower and lower. And the, as the fruit is maturing, up to, and this being the sugar increasing, the acid way over here that started out early is constantly decreasing. And a proper balance perhaps might be This thing creeps up ever so slowly when you get out here. The proper balance might be back over here, where you got that much sugar and this much acid. But if you have to leave, if you have to leave the fruit on quite a bit longer, in order to get the wait a minute, what am I doing here now? See, the sugar is going up, but it is going up very slowly, so that you don't. If, if this essentially levels off out here, let's level it off to get the extreme. When you get up here, it begins to level off. And then you finally have to get around to picking it. You've got this much sugar, finally, which, which uh, the winery says that you have to have, but the acid is dropped down so that you have an abnormally high B to A ratio, an abnormally high one, which is not proper for that variety. Whereas over here, you would have this being the, the sugar, you'd have a more, a more nearly balanced balling and acid ratio, which is the, the normal maturity of the fruit. Now, this is a pretty important concept to, to have in mind. Uh, I remember once a, a, uh, a fertilizer company went out and put on some fertilizer plots and came up and told me what fantastic results they'd gotten because this would happen to be with emperor or something like that, and they had picked out and got a, a quite a bit more fruit on their fertilized plot than they did on the uh, non-fertilized. But on the non-fertilized plot, this was a long time ago, I'll just illustrate it, they had something like uh, 30 to 1 ratio for the B8, for the bowling acid, which would have been a real nice uh, quality wine for crush, for making wine. But on their fertilizer plot, they were very proud of the fact that they had a bowling acid ratio of something like about 45 to 1 and a whole lot more fruit. And they were, had already written up a manuscript and were going to go to the national hort meetings and uh, ballyhoo the, the results of the experiment when I pointed out to them that nobody would buy this fruit. <laughs> so they scrubbed the paper off the program. <laughs> You've got to... You, you, sure, you can load a, a grapevine down. You should know it by now after all we've talked about this morning. But you cannot load it down. You do not want to load it down beyond the point where you can get the fruit mature in a proper length of time. And the first indication then of overcropping is that when your vines, you've got a vineyard and he's got a vineyard, and if his vines and his vines are all ready to pick on September the 15th with 22 bowling or what have you, and yours is still only 20 or 21, that's your first indication that you put on too much crop on that vine. A delay in maturity is your first best indicator for overcropping of vines. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be okay for table fruit? Well, if you didn't take it too far. But, but if you take it too far, you get a, a bag of sugar water is what you get because the acid keeps dropping down even there. Now, you've got a point. Up to a certain trend, you see 30 to 1, for example, um, we like 25 to 1 to 1 for ideal tops and seedless table fruit. And you might, it might taste a little better to some people with a sweet tooth if it goes up maybe to 30 to 1. But if it goes up to 40 to 1, then you've got nothing just but except bags of sugar with no acid and you have no sprightliness, no uh, uh, real flavor in the fruit, which is a good point. Well. That's not so important there. The main thing there is just to get the sugar up. I will discuss later on something about this, but uh, for, for raisins, the main thing you want is to get high sugar, and, you're, and really you don't really worry about the acid. If you're running grapes in Fresno <clears throat> that have 24 degree bricks, doesn't that mean you're going to have something like a 0.8 acid to get that 25 to 1? <laughs> I mean, that's yep. high acid. Well, I don't mean 1% acid. I mean a ratio of that. Uh, I should write it this way, 25 to 1. Is that better? I don't mean 1% acid. That's pretty acid. But you've got to have, uh, you see, if you, get grape, if you get grapes up then to 
to 20 degree bounding and you have eight tenths acid. That's what you're talking about. And that's about where the table fruit Thompson seedless ought to go to market. But they, they, they fudge some on that. They sent them off at 18. And uh, 18 degree bowling and 8 tenths acid is, pretty, uh, uh, is a pretty low ratio. But this is what some of the work that Dr. Winkler's done indicated as, as the threshold of real desirable eating quality in Thompson seedless. Okay, uh, I think we're, we've run out of time for today.